recursion. They exhibit non-linearity, non is that the outcomes are often qualitatively different from the elements. I encourage you to think about the idea that um, our sense of being, our sense of self, is much more than just the interactions of the neurons. It is qualitatively different. And they exhibit an order of an order chaos dynamic. I'll talk about this a lot over the course of the presentation. They have a history or lineage and are in a constant state of change and are thus time dependent. Hopefully this will become more clear as we pro progress. <clears throat> okay, first let's start with the diagram. Uh, my, old, my old students, you'll probably recognize this. This is a, a diagram of how complex systems are arranged. Of course, it is not this straightforward. Is that we'll have the interaction of individual agents or individual systems. This could be individual people. This could be individual cells that are interacting with each other. From their interactions, there will be the self-organization of a behavior or of some sort of pattern. And then this, uh, this behavior or pattern will positively or negatively, and usually both, positively and negatively, feed back onto the behaviors of the individual agents. We also have information coming in. This will be the incoming of, of energy, the income of energy or other forms of information. And this also affects the, the interactions of the individuals, which in turn affects the larger patterns, which again feeds back onto the individual agents and also feeds out into the larger world. <clears throat> so, we need uh, maybe a, a simple example. This example has well-defined well boundaries for a complex system. The uh, example of a stock market is that you have the individual agents, the stock traders buying and selling and trading stocks. From the buying and selling and trading of stocks, we get the formation of a pattern. This pattern then feeds back onto the behavior of the individual agents, of the traders. And maybe if we have a rising pattern here, then stock traders will, or other people will think, oh, I should invest in stocks. They're going up. And so then we then get a change in the pattern. The pattern then changes because of the changes in the behaviors of the individuals. And it continues up until we get the outside information, which would be the central bank, sees that we have a bubble, they raise interest rates, and then the whole system comes crashing down. So again, you can see this dynamic going on here. <clears throat> uh, we actually can apply this framework uh, to the heliotropic behavior of many plants is, again, we have the individual cells of the plants. Again, plants have no nervous system in a traditional sense. So we have the, in the interactions of the individual cells with the information coming in, which is the light outside or water outside or the nutrients in the soil coming into the system. This affects the behavior of each individual cell and then results in patterns that we can see here. We have these fairly uh, extravagant or fairly complex and often beautiful patterns that will form. <coughs> okay, uh, I just, hopefully you can see what I just said there. Okay. Uh, one of the keys to uh, complex systems is the process of self-organization of behavior and structure. So I want you to better understand self-organization. Self uh, according to uh, Gershenson and Halayan, uh, self-organization is an increase of order which is not imposed by an external agent. Okay? The requirements that we have here again are very similar to that of complex systems. Multiple components, constant input of energy, quantity of interactions among agents, process of feedback, and constant dissipation of entropy out of the system. <clears throat> so we have here, uh, the foundations for self-organization uh, lie uh, in part uh, within the research of Russian Nobel laureate Ilya Prigogine, okay, who won, the chemist, uh, who won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 1977 uh, for his work on non-equilibrium uh, 
non-equilibrium thermodynamics uh, and his theory of what are called dissipative structures. Dissipative structures are thermodynamically open systems that exhibit self-organized physical structures. Dissipative structures provide a framework for unifying physics, chemistry, and biology. Okay, so now all of a sudden we now have a theory that allows us to bring what have been increasingly uh, branching uh, hard sciences and we're able to actually begin to bring them back together. Um, and dissipative structures provides that framework. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I would argue that his research is probably some of the, if not the most important research of the 20th century. Um, in that he laid the foundations for being, being able to bring together a variety of disciplines. Okay? Uh, they are open. Okay? There is no organizing factor. They are open to energy and they will then organize these, their, these patterns will self-organize. Okay? All systems move toward entropy, or the diffusion, or balance of energy. We need the adding of energy into the system, which facilitates the interactions of the individual chemicals, or the individual atoms, or the individual molecules, that then result in the formation of these patterns. We find this with convection and turbulence, what are known as Bernard liquids, typhoon, excuse me, typhoons, hurricanes. Um, we also find it with what are called ferrofluids, uh, the belusov zabatinsky reaction, and also cymatic patterns in sand. Uh, well, I guess we can watch the, the cymatic patterns in sand, is that this is just sand spread over a metal board that has a frequency being generated underneath. And what you will see is you'll notice that the sand will organize into fairly complex patterns with nobody organizing it. It's just a result of the frequency. And they'll throw some more sand on here. And then uh, they're, what they're, I, I have the sound turned off. But what they're doing is they're constantly raising the frequency uh, of this board, and which is resulting in the changes of the patterns. Here we have the belusov zabatinsky chemical reaction. Uh, which is a, um, a mixture of chemicals that will then that result in fairly complex pattern formations. Uh, nobody is creating these patterns, as again, it has to do with just the way that the chemicals are interacting with each other. And here we have ferrofluids. And these ferro, we have a magnetized um, piece of metal here, and we pour this fluid over the top of it, and you can see this kind of spiking pattern that forms. Uh, uh, just from the process of magnetization and gravity and the fluid falling down. <clears throat> um, I will use ferromagnetism as a great example of self-organization. <clears throat> and uh, as well as the mathematical Ising model uh, formulated by Wilhelm Lenz. Uh, our understanding of ferromagnetism is based on the idea that electrons have positive or negative spins. The spin of one electron influences the spin of its neighbors, <coughs> uh, according to proximity, how close they are. Uh, at a significantly high enough temperature, uh, an iron bar, for example, uh, will maintain a zero uh, electrical charge, as we can see over here. Okay, so at a high enough temperature, uh, an iron bar will maintain a, a, a zero charge. And the reason this is due to the thermal effect upon the individual atoms. Uh, at, at a high temperature, each electron switches randomly between positive and negative, between a positive and negative charge or positive and negative spinning. Um, and they do this so quickly at a high temperature that they are unable to affect their neighbors. Okay, so atoms, atoms affect their neighbors, but at a high enough temperature, they are switching so quickly that they are unable to affect their neighbors. <clears throat> this neutral state 
of the iron bar is an example of an attractor state. And I will try to, I will define for you attractor states um, better, okay, uh, in the near future. <clears throat> the neutral state of the iron bar is maintained despite a great deal of random instability. When the temperature is lowered, moving down here to roughly in this area, uh, the electrons slow in their switching and increasingly begin to influence each other. The Ising model, which is down here, okay, this is, a, this is just a, a visual representation of the mathematical model. <clears throat> uh, the Ising, sorry, I lost my spot here. The Ising model illustrates the interactions between the electrons and their self-organization into magnetic domains. Okay, so the areas of black here would be a magnetic domain. Areas of white would be a magnetic domain. At some critical moment, in this case, the temperature, uh, caused by the temperature, uh, and this, this exact moment is, is generally predictable, but not precisely predictable, which is important to chaos, uh, all of the electrons within the iron bar will take on either the state of a positive or a negative magnetization. The iron bar has undergone a phase shift. It has shifted from this state to this state, or from this state to this state. But this is only at one scale that we are looking at it, actually. It is in the brief period between these phases, right in this region, uh, that exhibits wonderfully, these wonderfully complex uh, magnetic pattern domains, okay? So here we're going to look at this picture. Now you may think that this is actually a, a scale of size or, or how closely we're viewing it, and it's actually not. This is actually a scale of temperature and time. And so this is actually right about in here, this is right about in here, and this is right about in here. These, we get these amazing beautiful patterns that form right in the in between phase transitions between us between uh, attractor states <clears throat> so again what we have is we have the system is that we have in this case atoms the atoms are interacting with each other at a high enough temperature they're unable to really effectively interact with each other so the behavior or the pattern that is formed is uh, a, a, a zero magnetization, and but we have incoming information. If we add heat to the system, it will maintain a, a, a zero magnetization. If we lower the heat, the information changes. We lower the heat, that will change how these how these individual agents, how these atoms are interacting with each other, and will then begin to affect each other in a, in a wonderfully dynamic process. <clears throat> so. Self-organization of patterns is dependent upon simple rules, okay? John Conway created what's called the Game of Life, which is a model of cellular automata. The game follows four simple rules. Any cell, any live cell with fewer than two neighbors, with fewer than two neighbors dies, as if, by, as if caused by underpopulation. Any cell with two or three neighbors uh, live neighbors continues to live on to the next generation. And any live cell with three live neighbors dies as if by overcrowding. Any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell as if by reproduction. So I'm just going to randomly create an initial state. creating some live cells. I'm then going to start, and this process is going to be very quick. So again, we just have, this game is just following some very simple rules. And I will click start. We'll notice 
that we'll actually get formation of patterns. These patterns are not programmed. These patterns were not designed by the computer programmer. These patterns emerge from just the interactions of the cells, from just the interaction of the cells with other cells according to the rules of the, of the program. Uh, this here, this image is a result of a change to rule four of the game that I was just talking about. We can actually get some really complex patterns. Sorry, I'm going to continue doing that because I want to keep my water close to me. And I don't want to spill it onto the, onto the electronics. <clears throat> uh, cellular automata are believed to be very similar to some organic chemical behaviors uh, found in nature that result in specific uh, organic patterns. <clears throat> uh, some, of, some very actually interesting patterns can form, as we can see here. Uh, this is called the, the breeder pattern. This is the breeder pattern that results in these glider gun patterns. Uh, and again, these, were, these patterns were not created by anyone. These only actually uh, occur from specific situations in which uh, the ways that, they, that, that the um, individual uh, live cells interacted with other live cells, and we actually can get fairly complex patterns out of this. <clears throat> so, let's think of these patterns as attractor states, okay, given the conditions. Okay, so these, let's think about these as attract, what are called attractor states. Again, these attractor states are far from equilibrium, and they are continually changing and self-organizing. I'll try to show you some more of these attractors in real life. Well, and also in mathematics. Oops. Well, maybe I will not. That's unfortunate. <sighs> well, there's always a problem. <clears throat> Damn it, it's showing that their image is not videos. PowerPoint one instead of the... Yeah, this is, it says it's Google Documents. Oops. I do, I do want to show you this here. This is an example of an attractor state. These are called bubble rings created by dolphins. Again, what, we, what we're seeing here is we're seeing the maintenance of a pattern 
a, a stable pattern, but this pattern is far from equilibrium and is dependent upon the, the input of energy. In this case, the dolphin is providing that energy, uh, again, via the biological process. Uh, I'd love to show you more, but I don't really have time. Uh, if you, we've seen birds swarming, uh, a variety of cloud formations that you will find in life, and we are also able to replicate these using a variety of mathematical models as well. Okay, these are attractors. These are patterns that self-organize themselves in a variety of ways. <clears throat> okay, so this idea of attractors or attractor states that, that self-organize given the conditions is essential to our understanding of life. Chilean biologist Umberto Maturana and Fra Francisco Baba my pronunciation is horrible, Francisco Varela, uh, introduced the idea that the nature of all living systems involves a process of growth and adaptation while maintaining a distinct and discernible identity. And they named this process autopoiesis. Okay? Is again, we're able to maintain an identity even though it's a constant process of change. I encourage you to think about yourself and your body, specifically your skin and your pancreas. Your skin is replaced completely every 27 days, roughly. Your pancreas, pancreas, here? Right here? Yeah. Your pancreas, which is located roughly right here, is replaced every, I believe, uh, 24 hours, roughly. Okay, so the important part, structures of your body are, repla are constantly being replaced. <clears throat> this is, again, an example of an attractor state. In fact, think about this, is that on a physical level, 90% of all the cells in your body that, are, that comprise your body have been replaced over the last 20 years. And yet you maintain a feeling of self, I am Damon, even though on a physical level, I am almost a completely different person, yet I am still Damon. <clears throat> if, we, if we think, if something is just structure, a static pattern, then there is no life to it. Thus, for a unity, for something to be alive, it must maintain a structure while continually maintaining a dynamic openness to its environment. This is, i.e., metabolism. All living things maintain bal a balance of structure, i.e., stability, with dynamism. This balance is essential because it allows for life-sustaining reproduction that is neither chaotic, chaotic runaway growth, nor deadening fossilization. This allows for, again, positive and negative feedbacks that allow for a balance. If, if our brain just continued to always grow, well, then it would grow out of our heads and it would be of really of no use. It has to maintain a balance of structure versus growth. Okay? And this organizational balance, which allows for successful reproduction and growth, is impossible without the external environment. Okay? <clears throat> this leads us to the concept of what's known as mutual bootstrapping. I, uh, be careful, uh, because I think a lot of people's understanding of bootstrapping comes from uh, mathematics, and it is a little different. Um, so, with, uh, we will see this concept of mutual bootstrapping again and again throughout the presentation, is that patterns, unities, or systems are inextricably tied together in the process of ongoing adaptation and growth. Their proce the process of growth and change, the processes of growth and change continually feed off of each other and cannot be separated or ordered in a linear fashion. <clears throat> For example, uh, the South African mega-nosed fly and South a and a African guild of irises, geraniums, and herbs. Okay, the South. The South African megonosed fly 
has a mouth that extends about five times the length of its body. And a specific guild of irises or geraniums and herbs are wholly, completely dependent upon the meganose fly for pollination and hence for their reproduction. This is because the meganose fly is so specialized that it is the only pollinator capable of pollinating this specific guild of plants. <clears throat> However, the meganose fly derives pollen from a wider variety of flowering species. The nose did not evolve to fulfill the specialized function for which its body is perfectly suited. Again, the, the nose of this fly did not evolve for this specific function because it is not dependent upon these irises and flowers, but the irises and flowers are dependent upon it. The orchids, in this case an orchid, uh, could not have waited for the fly uh, to functionally evolve and become a meganosed fly. There is evidence, however, showing that the fly and this guild of flowers evolved over the same course of time. This evolution of the meganosed fly and these specific flowers was a mutual affair. And this is an example of structurally coupled co-evolution, or again, mutual bootstrapping. <clears throat> so, uh, another example that we can use, we, we can move to a smaller scale here it, in regards to this autopoietic concept of structural dynamic balance and mutual bootstrapping. For example, cell metabolism, oh I'm sorry, cells and the organelles that constitute structures, especially near the realms of the membrane, i.e. the boundary, that they are open enough to allow for metabolism. Um, my apologies. Okay. Cells and the organe organelles that make up the cells constitute structures, especially near the realms of the membrane yet they are open enough to allow for metabolism, respiration, or process. Cell metabolism is a unique situation as regards the relations of chemical transformations. On, uh, and this is quoting, I'm sorry, quoting Maturana and Varela. On the one hand, we see a dynamic, of dyna a network of dynamic transformations that produces its own components. Self-organization, replication, and growth and that is essential for the boundary. On the other hand, we see a boundary that is essential for the operations of the networks of transformations which produce it as a unity. The point here that I'm trying to make is that when we look at cells or mitochondria is that the, mito the cell needs the boundary to grow and yet for it to be able to organize its growing process, it needs the boundary. So which one came first? Neither. Neither of them could have come first, is that they must always evolve together. This is known, again, as structural coupling. <clears throat> there is structural coupling whenever there is a history of recurrent interactions leading to the structural congruence between two or more systems. For example, the word green, or the word that we now use as greenhouse, used to be separate words, green and house, and it then became hyphenated, and then now we just say <coughs> greenhouse. The, uh, according to Strunk and White, this is from their famous Elements of Style book, uh, the steady evolution of language seems to favor union. Two words eventually become one, usually after a period of hyphenation. Other examples that we might look at here. <coughs> Uh, Lynn Mar Margulis and Dorian Sagan assert that mitochondria, which is mitochondria we now associate as being part of a cell, were at one time actually a distinct bacteria that came to live within larger cells and ultimately became unified via symbiosis. Humans and certain fruits have developed a distinct relationship in which they rely upon each other for the maintenance of their life cycle. And this is specifically humans. Humans, unlike most mammals, do not have the ability to produce vitamin C. We actually used to have the ability to produce vitamin C, but we have become so 
coupled with citrus, that citrus fruits rely upon us to help them in their replication process, and we need fruit for us to maintain the vitamin C within our bodies. For example, the role of testing affects educational structures, and as such, educational structure reinforces the role of testing. They become so intertwined that their structures mutually reinforce each other. Specific cognitive abilities are given priority over other cognitive abilities. Those who thrive within the, cogni within the dominant cognitive structure reinforce the dominance of that cognitive ability over others. And I would argue that in current societies that that's uh, the mathematical cognitive abilities uh, identified by uh, Gardner's multiple intelligence. <clears throat> okay, so here we have a unity. A unity is a system, okay? In and of itself, it is a system. And it is a unity that relies upon the external environment for the input of information and energy. It is structurally coupled to the environment. You cannot separate it. Examples would be a flower needs sun, water, and soil. Mitochondria need the cytoplasm, the cell, and the incoming fats and sugars. Fish need water. This structural coupling occurs with the external environment and with neighboring unities. Okay, again, this would be cells become coupled together with cells to form a system. <clears throat> and, these, and these individual cells are, of course, also part of the external environment relative to the individual. The structural coupling of neighboring unities affects their behaviors and thus structures. This is an ongoing process of mutual bootstrapping in which the future of the individual becomes connected to the future of all the other individuals that it interacts with and with the environment. These unities, these individuals, are nested inside other unities at a multitude of scales. Okay, this would be molecular, cellular, the organism, individual organs and or organ systems, they are all connected. Yet, they are all primarily connected at the local level. If we look at, for example, cellular connections, most all cellular connections are all connected at the local level. And so, for example, the unity of the human body includes billions of microscopic parasites and bacteria, which are essential for our life. Billions of individual cells comprising a variety of internal organs, lungs, stomachs, etc. And these are all operating as parts as a, to a variety of systems, the nervous system, the immune system, etc. And again, we can see here one example here of our muscular, our muscular system. We have a variety of individuals, they coordinate with each other, they self-organize, and we get these larger structures. So, now I'm going to move into the self-organization of brain structure and function. Uh, this is a really cool attra uh, mathematical attractor, by the way. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, cognitive scientists, including, uh, including cognitivists and connectionists, uh, have long accepted the biophysical approach to neural modeling. Biophysical approach is that we try to... Uh, uh, emulate, or we try to copy uh, biophysics that found in real life. Okay, so here we have, for example, a connectionist heavy and learning model developed by uh, Professor Hebbs, and the connections between these nodes. So we have here nodes, and the connections between these nodes uh, vary according to stimulation, the strength. The strength of the, of the connections between all of these nodes vary according to stimulation. Learning occurs via the strengthening or weakening of the connections associated with excitatory or inhibitory pulse, which is, is itself associated with experience. Is that when we experience something, such as I pinch myself, is that that will then stimulate a layer of input units and that they will then in turn stimulate various hidden nodes and the, 
the connection will be strengthened in that process. <clears throat> the old view of the way that the brain develops was called predetermined epigenesis. This is the idea that we have genetic activity. Genetic activity leads to structure. Structure then leads to function. This is now irrelevant. Nice. This is now irrelevant, actually. The current view is what we call probabilistic epigenesis. And probabilistic epigenesis shows that we have genetic activity, affects neural activity, affects behavior, affects the environment, but also that the environment cascades back onto genetic, genetic uh, activity. Okay? So in fact, our neural structures are in part shaped, strengthened, and configured by our experiences. <clears throat> I'm, I'm skipping a little bit uh, because uh, I know that I talk a lot. <laughs> okay, our first example that we're going to see how probabilistic epigenesis manifests itself in reality uh, it uh, relates to how physiological and behavioral characteristics can be transferred across generations without genetic inheritance. This is not the sharing of genes through the reproductive process, but rather the transgenerational transfer of physiology and behavior through environment. Some really interesting stuff. Trust me. Okay? <laughs> Among rats and mice, mothers lick and groom, that will be LG, lick and groom their pups and perform what's known as arched back nursing. Okay? Uh, in the weeks just after giving birth. Some mothers do this, some mothers do not. The pups of the mothers who lick and groom and arched back nurse exhibit fewer signs of stress when put in a novel environment. Whereas the pups of mothers who do not lick and groom and arched back nurse exhibit high levels of stress when put in a novel environment. We might conclude that, oh, it's in the genes. Well, it's not, because when the pups are actually switched within their first week of birth, uh, which again is ethically questionable in my opinion, uh, but we find that the pups that are switched at birth take on the traits of their adoptive mother, okay, or respond to the traits of their adoptive mother. So furthermore, these behavioral responses uh, to the novel, to uh, novel environments, when they're put into a stress, uh, a new environment, their reaction of str uh, high stress or low stress, these persist into adulthood. And when a female pup ultimately becomes a mother, she will display the same behavior as the mother she was raised by, thus perpetuating the trend non-genetically. Weaver et al. Uh, found that this behavior is actually associated with genetic expression, not not genetic behavior, not genetic reproduction, but genetic expression. Bye, Breeze. <laughs> uh, it seems that the licking and grooming and arched back nursing stimulates the uh, production of serotonin within the baby's within the pup's brain. Okay, serotonin increase, then increases the production of a uh, nerve growth factor inducer, or inducible protein A, and then this then, uh, this protein then binds to the glutocorticoid uh, receptor uh, in the hippocampus, and thus then affects um, uh, hypomethylation. Uh, methylation is a process in which uh, methylation affects the expression of the individual genes. <clears throat> uh, does not change the genes, 
but affects the expression of the genes. Okay? The higher number of these receptors then within uh, the glute uh, within uh, the I'm sorry, I lost my spot here. Within the glutocorticoid receptor, uh, end up uh, end up maintaining themselves over the course of the rat's life. And a higher number of these receptors being in the hippocampus is associated with lower stress levels over the course of our life. So our responses to stress over the course of our entire life are actually often determined within just the first few weeks of our life as uh, babies, if we were to extrapolate this to, uh, as being representative of humans. Okay, so again, the effect of the external world uh, upon brain structure and development is not just limited to just the family. The wider environment plays a similar role. Most rats uh, in laboratories are raised in an impoverished